So we recorded a ton of content. Uh, and we tried to package it in a way that w it was concise, it was interesting. We obviously yeah. couldn't make three-hour episodes. We've got too many stories. We, we, have, we have way too many stories. Bonus stories. But there are some stories, bonus stories, that we cannot finish season one without at least sharing with all of you because some of these stories are so amazing. I mean, do you remember growing up as a kid in Canada and seeing these Canadian Heritage Minutes where it was this wonderful, I don't know, 30-second, one-minute ad, on, uh, literally, right. it, was, Laura it, was a, it was a television commercial <laughs> yeah. about Laura Secord and, yeah. and the cow, right? Yeah, exactly. And, 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 or some interesting tidbit yeah. about Canada. It turns out it was Charles Bronfman who was frustrated by the lack of storytelling, the narrative, the lack of, of Canadian pride, who went to his team and he said he banged his hands on the desk and said, yeah, we need more thing. of this. They, they, yeah, everyone used to bang their hands on the desk. Like, now like, I feel like, or, like super aggressive. In the Zoom meeting, you're banging yeah, like, yeah, the keyboard? Like, Microaggressions, <laughs> no good. Um, so, but because of his, his, his dissatisfaction with the pride and the brand of Canada, Charles went ahead and created Canadian Heritage Minutes. And I love you know, some of the stories that didn't make it in that you're now gonna hear about. One of the ones I love is Eddie Sunshine, how he talks about how he predicted the U.S. crash in 2008 and what he did about it in order to profit. It's amazing. I mean, you, 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 once you go a level deeper with some of these, some of these guys, what you realize, like one of the stories that Jonathan Weiner talks about is at some point in his life, he figured out that his grandfather was this incredible painter Right. And and there were paintings all over uh, all over Quebec, but they were in churches. And so he went on this hunt at a certain point to try to effectively acquire all these paintings. It was so important to him. Right. And the way he did it, I mean, he used his entrepreneurial instinct to acquire a family heirloom, which I thought was just so amazing. I mean, another one of my favorites, especially having taken Dave and Steve to the U.S. and experienced that, is how when Aldo took all those shoes into the US, how he approached that. And he did it in a very, very smart way. And most retailers failed by going from Canada Almost to the US. every single Canadian retailer fails in the US. And you can count them on one hand, it's the amazing. ones that have succeeded. So, okay, we have so many of these stories. Some of them we just wanted to make sure all of you saw because we love the audience. We know you love yeah. these stories and we love these people. And so we thought we'd share some of them with you in these bonus episodes. Yeah. Started from the bottom, now the whole team here. Started from the bottom, now we here. Started from the bottom, now my whole team in. Started from the bottom, now we here. Started from the bottom, now the whole team here. Yeah, I didn't keep it real from the jump. Living at my mama house, we'd argue every month. I was, I was trying to get it. My kids are seventh generation Canadian. Wow. Uh, grandchildren, eighth. Um, highly unusual. People right. used to say, how come you don't understand uh, Yiddish? Yiddish. Right. <laughs> and I knew all the wrong words, but uh, um, Yiddish was never in our family. Um, so, you know, recollection is early 1800s was the first arrival of the family. Um, my great-great-grandfather was a, uh, the first member of the, the RCA. Uh, the Royal Academy of Artists. Um, so he became the first Jewish member in 1866. Wow. Um, and we, we were walking around and I have, from one painting that I had, we've collected 140 of them over the last 40 years. And he was a contemporary of Kriegoff. They both worked in the Notman studio. Uh, he taught painting in uh, Lachine, uh, in a, a mother house called the Sir de Saint Anne um, and there's a fabulous little story there if I can interject that please yeah we for the last 25 years I had found out about the Sir de Saint Anne and the fact that my great-great-grandfather had an atelier right next to the altar and he had painted the two paintings of Christ left and right of the altar and then there was this beautiful little atelier where he taught the nuns to paint but he also did a lot of his own paintings, and I found 80 paintings of his there. Wow. And I was after the nuns every year for 25 years, asking them if they would consider selling the paintings, and I would even do reproductions and put them in the original frames because they didn't care about the frames. And they said, no, no, they weren't interested. So Charlie Flicker joined me as CEO of our family office, and I said, Charlie, one of your responsibilities is to check with the nuns every year. Second year, he comes beaming and beating his chest and telling me, you'll never guess. And I said, what? He said, the nuns have decided to close 
the mother house. They've sold it. And they want to give you wow. 40 paintings. It's unbelievable. And the 40, except for two, the other 40 went to the Lachine Museum. Except for two, I had the best of the lot. And I was over the top. I mean, I still get uh, my hair standing sure. on end thinking about it. And I said, why? They said, because you are the legitimate heir. Right. And we want it in good hands. Are you a painter yeah. yourself? I do some. Yeah. But I honestly haven't had a lot of time in the last 20 years. But right. I did a bit of painting. And I could see going forward, maybe I'll do some more. But it's self-taught. Started from the bottom, now the whole team here. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Started from the bottom, now my whole team. A huge moment for you also was 2008. You had some mm. sense that what was coming and sold some key assets. And then in 2009, you go into the U.S. at possibly Starbuck, the yeah, best yeah. time ever. Well, part of that was good fortune. Uh, not, not the U.S. That, was, that I'll take full credit or blame for it. Okay. But uh, I have to admit, I got a great advantage, first of all, from being on the World Bank Board. I went on the board in 2007, and you learn things if you keep your ears open. And Royal Bank, just for those listening, is not only the largest bank in Canada, but also the, I think the highest market cap company in the country yeah. and one of the most important banks in, on the planet. Yeah. There's an old story. Well, they're globally yeah. systemically important. Yeah. Uh, they're considered, they're one of the largest banks, uh, well over uh, a trillion dollars in assets. But I, I'm just smiling because whenever a company supplants World Bank as the number one market cap, I'm not going to mention tell names. Them this. <laughs> it's never a good ending. <laughs> but anyway, that's true. That, that's, that's true. So yeah. historically, they are the number one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. the Red Sox I, eventually won the World I, Series. I, I, was, I the, believe I, there's an exception to yeah, that. But, a, but, yeah. I believe yeah. you're right. Yeah. I hope yeah. you're right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, listen, Imperial Oil did it once, and then the oil market crashed. So it, you know, it's not just tech that's companies. true. By the way, the Royal Bank thing is, I mean. Remarkable. I mean, you talk about pre-war. This is like pre, pre, pre. Like this is the pinnacle of old money. Uh, old I money. had, Canada. I had yeah. thousands. Literally, for a guy like you to be on the board, emails and letters from Jews, right? Um, you know, saying how? To, and like my partner, my old partner sure. Lloyd Fogler called me up. He says, Eddie, that you're on the World Bank of, of Canada board. I, I can't believe it. I got to take you out for lunch. <laughs> right. Okay. A sun and shine on the board. Yeah. So, and I remember Ira Kluskin, yeah. who, who I'm yeah, sure no, you know, yeah. called me up and he said, Eddie, that's so amazing. You're on the board. I said, so I was trying to be humble. I said, ah, there's a Jewish seat. <laughs> so he said, you know what? First of all, I don't believe that. They wanted you. But even if there is a Jewish seat, they picked you out of 350,000. Yeah. So <laughs> that's not so it's bad. Good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Funny, I think Ira just sold his company or, or is now at Royal Bank. Uh, he, oh, Gluskin wow. Chef, I think, is now. No, he left 13 years ago. Okay. Glus Onyx. Gluskin Chef, Onyx. And then Onyx. And, and, but just and Onyx. Onyx, they were sold the Darby yeah. yeah. no, no disrespect yeah. to Jerry Schwartz. Yeah. But uh, they've sort of. Pushed it the out. The guys were all leaving. Yeah. And they were going to RBC uh, GAM, the okay. global asset management. So they just made a moved deal. There. Got and it. Moved it over. It's yeah. unfortunate. Uh, but. Um, how did that board thing work? How did that even happen? Well, it, well before yeah. even that, sure. I mean, just before I went on the board, in the, in the summer of 07. Yeah. Uh, I had uh, a senior banker that I knew uh, who was at Bank of Montreal, actually, and he was head of real estate. And we had a lunch and golf planned mm -hmm. that afternoon. And he called me up that morning. He said, you know, Eddie, I can't go play golf because I, I got a meeting. I said, well, you didn't, you didn't, uh, what kind of meeting? You're going to set aside a golf game. And he said, well, you know, I have to. I said, well, you want to still do lunch? Sure. So we went out for lunch. And uh, I said, well, I said, what kind of meeting? It suddenly came up. He said, well, look, we don't use the word emergency in the, in the bank, mm -hmm. but so we call this an unscheduled meeting. Mm -hmm. I said, well, what's going on? He says, I don't know, but it's really quite odd. He said, I don't know if you know this, but let, let's say we do a $100 million loan to Riaquet. We'll, the way banks work, we'll typically sell off $90 million of that loan because we want to keep our book open for you. We don't want to use up all our, you know, let's say your limit with us might be a billion. Mm -hmm. but So we don't want to use it all up. We want to have more room. Plus we make fees by administering it. And you never even know who yeah, you owns no your loan. Yeah. You don't know. That's the way banks work. I said, actually, I didn't know that. He said, well, he said, that's like the most liquid market and, you know, active market. Well, suddenly over the last few days, 
there's like almost no bids. Like a recant credit is a great credit. I'd expect a bid of 99.5 on a dollar. Mm -hmm. The bids are coming in at 90. It means they don't want it. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to sell it. So, and then he says, so we're having a meeting. saying, so like, what's, what's going, going on? on? I went back to my office. I didn't go play golf. And I said, what's going on? <laughs> you know, there's something going on. And I called a couple other bankers I knew. I said, Dude, I'm hearing things. I didn't mm -hmm. give up my source. And he said, yeah, yeah. I said, well, what does it mean? And, and sort of what it started to mean was, to these guys, there's a lack of liquidity in the system. So banks aren't that flush. They don't have enough capital, maybe. They're losing deposits, maybe. And there's a problem, perhaps, on the horizon. Mm -hmm. So I looked at it, and uh, the way I ran Riacan, we had, this was in the fall of 07. Uh, we had, every year, I would take the guys down after we issued our year-end results in uh, February. Mm -hmm. um, I was already going to Florida for a few weeks. Uh, everybody fly, all the senior execs would go down to Florida. <laughs> it sounds very, very uh, you know, uh, nice, but we basically lock ourselves up in a boardroom in a hotel uh, for two to three days and we go through every property we owned. Mm -hmm. you know, a couple of hundred of them, some, at that time 250, looking for challenges, opportunities, you know, what can we do to make things better? What should we sell? Whatever. That's what we came out of. And we came up with the sort of property level business plan for that year. We already had a budget, mm -hmm. and then we did the, the business plan on the property level, having that budget in mind. And uh, I said, guys, I said, uh, right at the beginning of the meeting, I said, everything I hear is there's liquidity issues happening already, and it's going to get worse. So I said, I got to go back to base case of how Reacan works. Everything, the most important thing is called cash flow. Second most important thing is liquidity. Actually, the two go together. Mm -hmm. So I said, I want to start with isolating every property we have that doesn't have any cash flow or isn't cash flowing for its debt. Mm -hmm. Happily, not that many, mm -hmm. but we had a whole bunch of land uh, things that- Don't that, generate any cash. That don't, right. they're, they're a liability. That's right, right. just <laughs> cost. Because you're paying taxes, you're paying, right. you know. And I said, so we came out of that meeting with a, with a program to get rid of them as many as we could as the next six months. And we were able to generate a lot of cash. We sold land. Uh, we sold some lower performing shopping centers. Uh, we got a bunch of mortgages while getting was good. And uh, then, and of course, by uh, later that year, Bear Stearns went, Lehman Brothers went, yeah. and you had the great, great financial, financial crisis. crisis. Yeah. Now, the only good news about that was it only lasted six months because the central banks just flooded the, you know, the, the old Joe helicopter Ben Bernanke. And the reason he was called that, he said, you know, they didn't have to be a depression. They would have had helicopters in those days. Just, I would have flown around a helicopter, dropped out bundles of cash, and there wouldn't have been a depression. Depressions get, uh, 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 are caused by a lot of things, but the root cause is nobody, nobody has any money. money. Yeah. And, and liquidity just goes away. So central banks have actually figured that out, and they flooded the banks mm -hmm. with cash. Yep. And that's how they fixed it. And, and then we came this spring, and I saw Simon down in the States. Property group. Uh, yeah. Uh, Biggest, Largest, yes, David small, Simon, yeah. biggest, biggest guys in the, in the world, literally, yeah. uh, <laughs> based out of Indianapolis, of all right. places. And, Juice, uh, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Juice. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he owns uh, the... Uh, David Sun. Uh, owns the uh, Indiana Pacers. Cool. Yeah. That's why most of the Jews in the NBA, you know... Most, and authentic brands. Yeah, I know. Yeah. He, he nominated Larry Tannenbaum to be... Uh, Larry is the chair, the, the governor... Of the NBA. Of the NBA. Of the yeah. NBA Nominated by David Simon. Wow. And it's pretty cool for a Canadian Very guy. cool, yeah. But anyway, uh, I saw Simon did a, a uh, unsecured debenture deal in the States in uh, March. And now uh, they paid, I think, 12% or something, but they got it done. Yep. So I said, you know, I think the markets are starting to open. So we're watching very carefully. And I, I'm not talking to the bankers at this point because they're, they're, they're hiding under their desks, the bankers. <laughs> But who I was talking to were the guys who actually bought the bonds. And uh, one of the, the head of bonds at uh, TD Asset Management at mm -hmm. the time, it, it was, uh, I can't remember his name, it was an Indian guy, but I can't remember his name, he was very smart. 
he was like a PhD in math. And uh, I called him up and I said, if I wanted to do a Riyakam bun now, could I get an order from you? He said, well, usually bankers call me for orders. I said, well, I'm not doing one. It's not a real order, but give me a notional order. What spread over Canada is what I have to pay to get you to, to buy? And he thinks for very quickly, a few seconds, he says, you know what, Eddie? You do 600 over Canada's, I'll take as much as you want to issue. Wow. He said, I said, what if I want to issue a billion dollars? I'll take it. Now, is it, this is because you cleaned up your balance sheet. You have such a strong cash flow AAA business. AAA rating. And, and they right. felt the world was writing itself. Got it. Right. So he was making a double. He was betting on our credit, which was good. Yeah. Right. But, but at a massive premium relative to the risk. 600 over. I mean, we, right. before the great financial crisis, we were doing deals at 200 over, 150 over. Right. 600 over was crazy. But you know, I didn't say no. Yeah. And then I started calling the bankers. I said, guys, if I get you a lead order, I didn't need a billion. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, I said, if I get you a lead order on a $500 million issue, what do you think it should go at? Anyway, when all was said and done, we thought we could do the deal at around 500 over. And I didn't want to sell it all to one guy anyway, so if he... And he wanted 600 anyway. Yeah, but he came in the deal. Okay. 600 was his opening bid. Okay. Uh, in fact, he took, he took, he ended up taking half the deal. Okay. I mean, what's 100 between friends? Uh, nobody's friends. It's 1%, right. what do you mean? It's <laughs> you, you got to remember, bond guys will kill you for one basis point. Yeah, I mean, right. it's, it's 100 basis <laughs> points. <laughs> That's how they make a living. But the, the um, uh, we, we go, we're, we're going to launch on a Monday morning. That weekend... General Motors declared bankruptcy. Oh my God. They, they declared bankruptcy, General Motors. And I got a call on Sunday night, Eddie, we're not launching. <laughs> right after the GM announcement. Why not? What have I got to do with GM? Uh, the markets are gonna be in disarray, we gotta wait. Anyway, so all day Monday, I'm talking to the bankers. They, they wouldn't do it, they just wouldn't do it. <laughs> Even though I called the guy at uh, TD, he was, he was okay. Mm -hmm. Tuesday morning, I finally said, I said, look, either you guys launch or I'm going to another bank. They launched, was successful, got it done at 500 over. Uh, a year later, I actually bought it back. Wow. Because it was done at uh, eight and three quarters percent. A year later, I could do them at 4%. Right. So it was worth it paying the penalty. So these guys who bought that bond made out like bandits. Of course. Started from the bottom, now the whole team here. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Another little fun sort of aside in the book is um, you talk a lot about heritage minutes and, and heritage fairs, which, by the way, my, I asked my 12-year-old daughter, I'm like, did you have a heritage fair last year? And she did. It's still going on. Um, but in that, in that conversation, there's this funny part where you, I believe, were backing the Canadian, uh, was it the CFB there? The CFB Canadian Film Board. Canadian Film Board, um, right. which funded Degrassi, which, right. which is where Drake... Became Drake. Became right. Drake, got right. his start, which yeah. is, you know, a huge, huge success. And well, actually, well, just before we finish, I, let's talk just quickly about the Heritage Minute thing. Because, you know, again, country, uh -huh. industry, company. That first one, country. I agree. I mean, I, like you, I, I, I spent a lot of time, I was, grew, up, I grew up in Canada, but I also lived in the U.S. for quite some time and, and uh, went to high school in the U.S. So I understand that Canada is a very special place. I've chosen to live here. But Canadians are not necessarily always as proud of this country as, as they should be. I, I loathe that. I talk about that. You actually did something about it. Talk a little bit about why the Heritage Minute thing was, was even even well, something I, wanted I, to I also was in Canada. I was in the States. I was back and forth. And at one point in the 80s, I said, you know, the real religion of Americans is love of country. Right. I don't ever think that Canadians should be like Americans, but we don't have any passion for our country. And that's when I came up with the thought that a society is composed of heroes, heroines, and myths. And don't forget the myths, because they're important. And we don't have any except Laura Secord and her damn cow. So, but, but there's got to be a lot of stuff here. And the Americans did a bicentennial uh, operation. They had stuff on TV. I think they're also one minute things. I came back to Canada and I banged my fist on the table. I said, guys, this is what we're going to do. And uh, Tom Ashworthy, who was then running our 
foundation, he had been the principal secretary to Pierre Trudeau. Uh, he got hold of Patrick Watson, who just uh, passed away, he was a wonderful guy, and Michael Levine in Toronto, who was a business end of life. And, and we started the Heritage Ventures, and it was just that simple. I mean, they were simple like hell. It wasn't so simple. <laughs> we went to Ottawa, and it, and fortunately, it was not considered advertising. Uh, secondly, the uh, CRTC, Canadian Radio, Radio and Television Commission, gave points for Canadian content. Mm -hmm. This was Canadian content. Right. Which so, helps the American agent uh, networks, right? Right. And, and so this became a come on to the GV stations to run it. Then at the time, uh, we owned, uh, what the heck was the name of the chain of, of movie houses? Cineplex. No, yes, we own Cineplex. You own Cineplex? Yeah, we own Cineplex. It's a footnote. <laughs> it's not even in the book. It didn't even make a footnote. <laughs> didn't make the book. It wasn't that successful, so why, why talk about it? I mean, it's today. <laughs> yeah. uh, so anyway, we ran them in the Cineplexes because we insisted, as I insist on everything, but quality. And so the Heritage Minutes were made for movie quality, where others are just TV quality. And uh, they took off. Amazing. Right, and for people listening, I mean, the, my favorite one you talk about is James Naismith, who, the Canadian who invented basketball. And you talk about Canadians being able to go down and visit their American cousins and say, hey, guess what, you know, that game you love, it's on us. We, we made that happen. And, and I, I, I laughed. That was literally me. I'd go visit my cousins in Boston and, and I'd brag about it all day long. It was great. <laughs> Dave and I, in our research, figured this out, which is fascinating because up until that point, very few Canadian retailers were able to expand successfully to the U.S. Yeah. Not only did you, did you think about doing so, you did so successfully. Yeah. That, to us, that also showed a lot of chutzpah and a lot of ambition. Tell us about that because yeah, how all of your, that? how did you do it? All your predecessors failed at that. Ba basically, again, it's a question of encouragement by people and things like that. And I remember, um, what's his name? Um, um, a big brand in the United States, uh, Stuart Wiseman. Yeah. yeah. So Stuart Wiseman came to visit us in Montreal and we were looking, showing him my collection and what we were doing, etc. And Stuart said to us, he said, you know, Aldo, you, you, you know, those shoes are fantastic. Your price point is great. I don't understand why you don't go to the States. So he really encouraged us wow. in opening to the, in the States. And he was, he was already in the States. He oh, yeah, yeah. He had, he he had, had a big brand. Right. He had, That's you right. know. So he asked, so he and, encouraged you. Yeah. And uh, so... What we did is that we opened, we didn't want to take a big risk because at that time, you know, we saw so many people failing, yeah. you know. Everyone had failed. I mean, exactly. the Chateau. I know. Right. Yeah. Twice exactly. they tried it. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, so what we did is that we opened in Plattsburgh and in Plattsburgh Shopping Center, which is an hour Right around the here. corner, yeah. yeah. We open and, you know, we try to ship and, you know, to make sure that the logistic was working. And after a year and a half, we decided to open in Boston. How were the sales in Plattsburgh? Was it? They were pretty good. Pretty I mean, good, we yeah. didn't make too much money, but right. we didn't pay too much but, rent. But the, but the and Plattsburgh idea was really, let's test it, the model. Let's, let's figure test out the how model shipping as far as the tackle. shipping, the logistics and everything. Then you go to Boston. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't just smooth sailing from there no, on no, to Broadway no, 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 in New no. York, right? Well, again, it's a question of luck. Remember, you see, when our expansion, today we're operating about 300, 350 stores in the United States. Right. And at one point, like uh, two years ago, before right. COVID, it was like 450, yeah. right. you know? And uh, we closed quite a few stores. But um, so when we moved to... a uh, it was a question of luck in the sense that there was a lot of shopping center opening. Yep. You know, the Tobman and, the, you know, yep. the Simon, yep. you know, they were opening all kind of shopping center and they would come to us and say, you know, they have to fill it up. And, sure. uh, you know, 
So they would give us great, uh, you know, condition terms. And that's how we expanded, if you want. Wow. And so it's mostly mall, not street front? Malls, malls yeah. Was it's mostly mall. Yeah. Yeah, 95%. Yeah, oh, I mean, 98%. Is and that. why did you decide at one point um, to, to launch multiple brands? So you had the Aldo brand. Yeah. And then there's Little Burgundy, because, there's Spring, there's yeah, a bunch of brands. Yeah. yeah. I mean, basically, I mean, it's it's different way of running the business. Right. But um, we feel that, let's say with Aldo, we were catering to or focusing on one group of consumer. Then on spring, or call it spring, we're, we're focusing on another one. With global, we're focusing on another one. So each one has a different market. Right. Now, uh, other people, you know, think differently if you look at Apple if you right. look at uh, you know sure. they uh, you know they don't it's kind of a one size fits all yeah. of exactly cases. Nike I mean, yeah. 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 yeah Nike okay. yeah yeah, yeah. Huh. and did you bring all those brands into the US as well or US is only Aldo? Uh, right now it's only Aldo but before yeah. we used to have yeah the other brand so you went Plattsburgh Boston and then New York and then New York then well New York. I mean what happened is also we were in the States and uh, we were doing well. We were also, um, I can't remember, I'm not sure now. We were, anyway, we studied in Canada and then at one point we had fellow Sam Nesri that used to work in, uh, at Max mm -hmm. in yeah. Canada and he decided to make Aliyah, Aliyah to Israel and he left and went to Israel and maybe three four years after he arrived in Israel he came back to Canada came to visit me and he said look I looked I studied the market and I um, I think you know that there is room to open store Aldo store in Israel and I said uh, really I mean you know uh, so anyway, we had a good talk, but after, you know, maybe a day or something like that, I said to him, I said, fine, you could open the store. And, you know, I checked, you know, uh, here, and I said to myself, I said, what happened if he fails in Israel? Nobody would know. Right. Israel Small is country. very far. Yeah. And so he opened his store, and today he has between Spring and Aldo, he has close to uh, 80 or 90 stores. Wow. And you kept him as the... And, and, and so then, you know, you say, you're doing well in Israel, you're doing well in Canada, might as well, you know, open in Dubai, might as well open in Philippines, Portugal, and wow. etc. Et Started from the bottom, now my whole team in. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Started from the... The thing that struck us is incredible. Is it 52 years in the business? In a business where people sue each other left, right, and center, you've never been in a lawsuit. So, so when David told me this, I said, David, I think you should, you should go back. Like, there is no way yeah. that in 50 years of business that there has not been a major lawsuit. There's not. There's not been. How, how can that be? There, how? there is only, there was one that was a, um, a situation, and it wasn't me in particular, it was the whole joint venture. So us alone, we haven't had that. Um, the joint venture, we had a building that we bought with the Case de Depot mm -hmm. um, in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. It was the size of the Royal Trust. Well, you would know it now as the Telus building right. on, across from Place Fulmery. Which I hear is a story in and of itself, which yeah. we should come back. Yeah. It's a great we'll story. Yeah. Um, actually, it's one of the best. Yeah. Um, it got hit by a tornado. Uh, we had bought it for $35 million. Uh, and imagine a 600,000 foot, 30 story building got hit by a tornado oh and obliterated. Wow. Obliterated, okay? Furniture was five city blocks away. Oh the sprinkler heads had been ripped off. The water was flowing everywhere. We thought we would rebuild. We didn't rebuild because the building was condemned because there's a rule that you, if you have more than a 50% destruction, you must meet the current code. And it was impossible to meet the current code. With the old structures? 
with the old structure. Yeah. And so the building could fit for an apartment building, but it couldn't work as office. Um, we ended up having an offer of settlement of $85 million. Um, not too shabby. Not too bad. But we, in there, there was a club, and they um, they went after us uh, for a lawsuit for three and a half million bucks. Um, we went to them and said, "Look, uh, actually, it was six and a half million. We said we'll give you three and a half million. We just don't want a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. We've made enough money on this. We don't need. Right. And in our in our shop, we say." A bad settlement's better than a good judgment mm -hmm. because you never know with totally. a judge where it's going to end up. A bad settlement's better than, than a good, good judgment. judgment. I love yeah. that. So, uh, long story, it went on for three years. Both sides spent three million apiece on legals. But wait, they only wanted three and you were offering six. No, right? no, they wanted six, he they offered three. Six. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, we both spent three on Eagles, yeah, and we ended up settling for the same thing. Hey, incredible! That's the only lawsuit. Started from the bottom, now the whole team here. Yeah, I didn't keep it real from the jump. Living at my mama's house, we'd argue every month. I was, I was trying to get it on my own.